friend of mine told me recently that they couldn't understand how come I was so happy in the morning and I must be a morning person and why they were so sad and kind of bummed out and you know took a while to get things going they had to add their cup of coffee or their their cigarette or their their routine take a shower get cleaned up splash water cold water in their face and I said well it's kind of a matter of perspective I said really <coughs> I don't wake up feeling oh boy oh boy oh boy I said I wake up feeling pretty groggy I said matter of fact I feel a little soggy but the things that I look at and the things that I hear affect me so because I know they do I kind of take extra attention to them I take the extra moment to maybe hey God uh, can I get an attitude adjustment and so I asked them you know well, what do you do in the morning I said well you know I I pop over to the TV and I kick it on to see what the weather's going to be like, you know, and I listen to the news while I'm getting ready, you know, and I get cleaned up and I thought, well, what kind of news? You know, and the person looked at me like, give me a break. Well, the bottom line is, if you're programming yourself with bad news, no offense, don't you think it's going to affect you? I mean, I remember there was a time when I was in Alaska and uh, the way I got there was a little tragic was that I had crushed my foot underneath a quad a four-wheeler and the four-wheeler had popped a wheelie you know and well actually popped a wheelie I was on a uh, incline and I was going up an incline from a floating dock to a stationary dock which was about like this and I was at an angle and I was going up it and it slid back down, going up it and slid back down. And there's a metal railing on one side. And I was going up it and then it kind of popped a wheelie, coughed. I hit the gas by accident. It popped a wheelie. I was like this, put my foot down and the foot peg caught my foot and crushed it. Well, then I carried the bike down to the floating dock. There was nobody around and the pier was long and, well, I don't know, about a mile long, something like that. Because it was one of those, you know, 30 foot high tides. And, so anyways, the point being is that I, I was rushed to the hospital because they found me crawling and I'm basically out of my mind out in the middle of the boonies, you know, the bush in Ketch, uh, in Hyder, Alaska. And so they rushed me to a Canadian hospital and rushed me there and took care of me and blah, blah, blah and shipped me off to eventually to Ketchikan. Well, in Ketchikan, I had my foot in a kind of like an expansion cast so that it was kind of cut so that I could take care of myself because I had no money and uh, I had no insurance and I had no means of income and with little money I had I had to throw into a motel room to take care of me temporarily so one day I uh, <coughs> I said Lord I'm starving <laughs> it's gonna get hungry here pretty quick so I said I gotta go to work so I took my military boot my old boondogger you know black boot you know from Marine Corps and I opened up the stitches as big as I could, took my foot out of the cast where it had been externally manipulated for all the bones that were broken, and stuck my foot in that boot and I laced it down just as tight as I could stand and I stood up and about passed out. Boom, you know, I was like, whoa, Lord, this isn't gonna work. So then I said, well, if I could walk across to the sink and uh, sure enough, I made it over to the sink and this was a one room apartment in a shanty part of town in Ketchikan. So it was pretty, pretty shabby. I remember looking out my window and the only thing I could see was a brick wall. So it's one of those kind of things. And so I made it across to the sink, you know, and I splashed water on my face because it was like really painful. And the next day I went out and I kind of talked my way into this job as a dishwasher slash prep cook slash you know, go for it helper kind of person that this guy was starting a restaurant that was going to become famous eventually in about a year called the Ketchikan Cafe. And it was opened up above a bar and had a beautiful view and whatever. But he, long story short, you know, he got it going. So every morning 
with a broken foot and crushed foot with severe pain and no pain med, you know, no drugs, no alcohol, you know, I, I would pop on Amy Grant's tape, one tape, and it was um, Love of Another Kind. It had this upbeat kind of positive music that was like boom, 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 you know, and I would just roll over, pop it into my little cassette player, you know, and it was like a little tiny one, you know, and it was kind of like, you know, dual thing, you know, and had a, it was a cassette, and I wore that cassette out because it would, they say love is good, they say love is kind, they say love, 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 love of another kind, you know, and it was just like one song after another, just upbeat, bam, 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 go, 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 and I would slash on my boot, you know, and because my foot was always like this huge before I, you know, I'd try to cram it down in there and I'd get it on and I'd be in pain. So I would get up, get cleaned up, run down to the Catch Can Cafe or walk fast, you know, because it was a long ways. And then uh, get going, you know, but I'd keep that music playing because it was programming my mind and keeping me distracted from the pain. So I was able to, until it healed, which, you know, probably healed funny because I still kind of got soreness, but... Until it healed, you know, I was just moving around with these boots on, you know, and it took me a long time, you know, to, to pretty much heal. And one of the things that I learned from that was that that constant reinforced programming into my mind actually brainwashed me in a way to focus my attention on God. God got me through that year, and it was a tough year. <laughs> oh, boy, was it rough. But my attitude was always positive, you know. I was working with a, believe me, a cook that was really challenging. And so the focus of my attention was back on God, and God used that to not only change me, but the words, the lyrics of the song caused me to really change my attitude. It wasn't focused in on the pain, but it was going past it to revive my spirit so that I could run with God. I could talk with God. At the end of the year, I was running down steps, running up steps. I was being a waiter. I was in a uh, prep cook. I was assured I was going to get a $10,000 bonus before they wound up, you know, going out of business. But then they went back in business in Juneau, I understand. And supposedly, I have a bonus waiting for me somewhere. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But the point being is that God was able to use that morning time with Him when I changed the direction of my attitude and my actions to reflect His glory in me. And God wants you to do that. He doesn't want you to be caught up in the world in His ways, you know, putting on the news or, you know, jogging to some, you know, kind of like, you know, whatever secular music you got, because secular music is great for the soul, but it does nothing for your spirit. What you need to do is turn the attention of the attitude of your heart back to God, directed towards Him, so that He can take His Spirit and put it inside you. So as you do, I think you'll find that when you change your direction, He will cause inspiration to come into your day. Following God's priorities, the sheep that are my own hear and are listening to my voice, and I know Him, and they follow me, from John 10:27. Many people try to feel spiritual by obeying religious laws, but they never get around to feeling good, because there's always one more law to follow. That is why God does not define our righteousness by our works, but by our faith in Jesus. We feel inner peace when we obey the voice of the Holy Spirit. God may tell you that it is more important to give away your favorite personal possession than to try to please Him by reading the Bible through in a year. He may say that it is more important to just remain silent if he tells you to, than to volunteer for activity at church. His ways are not our ways. See Isaiah 55, 8, 9. <coughs> so learn to listen for his direction each day. As you do, believe it or not, it may not be a religious activity sometimes. It could be something as simple as making it easier on your wife. You know, like my wife and I, we have a kind of a spoken law that when I get up, I spend time in the ministry, she spends time getting ready for work, and I keep very distant from her, and she's one of those morning people that she has her routines that she likes, and for me, to bless her, I give her space, and sometimes that's all it takes.
It's not about sitting down on your knees every time with your partner, you know, and praying and making them work some kind of religious attitude up. Sometimes it's about giving them a place and a space to just be themselves with God. That's what you need in the morning, to be what God wants you to be this morning. As you choose, as you seek, as you follow Him today. Walk in His way today.